This morning, uh, we're continuing our series that we began last week on the book of Ruth. And I'm excited as we go through this. Of course, today is Father's Day. And, uh, and I'm so thankful to the Lord that today we're going to talk a little bit about how fatherhood worked itself out in the story of Ruth. And uh, as we do that, I'm sure you, like me, are reflecting a little bit on, on your childhood and, uh, and your dad. And, uh, and I know for my dad, I, I always think it's interesting. Something happened to me the other day that was unusual. I, I went to take my dad out for lunch for Father's Day on Thursday. And outside of the funeral home where I went to pick him up, my dad's a funeral director. And uh, outside was this old antique, I think it's from the 1950s. It's an antique flower car slash hearse. And uh, for the first time in my life, I'm not sure I would say this if Felissa were here because uh, I, I don't know what she'll, how she'll react to this. But for the first time in my life, I thought to myself, you know what? Whenever my dad dies, I, I wouldn't mind having that flower car. I think that'd be kind of cool to own that. And uh, Felissa might think that's absolutely crazy and I'm not wishing that my dad died. But it, it did kind of make me reflect. My dad's a little bit different. My dad's not kind of like the athlete dad. Uh, I truly don't know. And I mean this uh, in, in full love. I don't know if my dad would be able to tell you how many quarters are in a football game or a basketball game. I don't know that he would be able to tell you the number of innings in a baseball game. That just wasn't my dad. Uh, but I, I remember... Uh, growing up with my dad, every once in a while, I would say, you know, dad, will you race me? We didn't, you know, we didn't do a lot of athletic things, but I remember one night we were at Walmart for some reason. It was just me and my dad. I said, dad, will you race me to the car? Because I thought, oh, my dad, you know, he's not really into athletics. Maybe I'm faster than my dad. And, uh, and that night, the only time I remember it, my dad takes off on a run. And we raced to the car. And I'm telling you, I remember that, just that, that one moment. And, I, and I, I think for all of us, we've got moments with our dads that are so special, aren't they? I mean, moments that maybe our dads wouldn't even remember. But there are moments that really are uh, just formative in our lives. And we love our dads so much. And it, it reminds us, uh, as a dad, it reminds us of the weight of responsibility that we have as dads, doesn't it? And, uh, and for my dad, my dad told me one time, he said, Tim, I've never thought it's fair uh, the way that sermons work with Mother's Day and Father's Day. Because on Mother's Day, right, we always talk about how amazing moms are, and, and we always kind of uplift moms and exalt moms. But on Father's Day, the sermon is almost always about, oh, how bad dads are. Moms are amazing, but dads, we need to pick up the slack here and be better dads. And so this is what I'm going to try and do uh, today. I don't want to add a weight to you in addition to the weight that you already have. We know it is a heavy responsibility. And yet for us, we need a reminder that in the midst of that responsibility that we have, the only hope that we have to be a dads that leave a true legacy of blessing is to trust in the power of God. And so uh, today, we're going to look at the book of Ruth, and we started last week reading just the first few uh, words, really, in the book of Ruth, and it says this, that the book of Ruth takes place in the days when the judges judged. And we talked about what that means, that it was a dark time in the history of Israel. The Bible says of that time that every man did what was right in his own eyes because there was no God in Israel. And so this was a time when people, it was really a time of anarchy. It was kind of the wild, wild west of Israel's history where there was no king, there were, where there was no standard. And for a few hundred years, people did what was right in their own eyes, creating a very dark moment. In the midst of this time, in the days when the judges judged, God is going to raise up this woman named Ruth to, to offer an example of faith. But before we get to that, there are several verses at the beginning of Ruth that we need to understand. And here's what I love. I believe they have something to tell us this morning about fatherhood. Because we're going to talk about a man whose name, we're going to learn in a couple of verses, his name is Elimelech. And Elimelech is a man who lives, and think about this, in the midst of a very dark time. And we're going to look at the decisions that he made that had an impact on his family that resonated down through the generations. And here's what you need to know about Elimelech. There are a few things the Bible tells us. The Bible tells us that he's from the tribe of Judah. He lives in the town of Bethlehem. You know Bethlehem. It's the city of David. And he lived in this time, in this dark time, and he had to face choices about the survival and the health and the flourishing of his family. And that should immediately, I hope, cause us to lean in and to ask ourselves, okay, how did Elimelech navigate this dark time? Because after all, do you not have the feeling that we live in the midst of dark times? 
And, and I know for me, as a dad and as a believer, and I hope for you, if you're a dad or if you're a believer here this morning, you want to know and I want to know, what does it look like to navigate these dark times in a way that is going to lead to the flourishing of our families and to the flourishing of our homes and churches and communities? And so Elimelech is a man who lives in Bethlehem of Judah. And yet he's going to face a time, as we're going to read, there's a time of famine, it's a time of darkness, and he's going to have to face decisions that are going to be very difficult, and they're going to have consequences that go with them. So I want us to dive in as we think about this man and we think about his life. We're going to dive in in uh, Ruth chapter 1, and we're going to start there in verse 1. It says this, during the time of the judges, we've talked about that, a dark time, there was a famine in the land. And a man left Bethlehem in Judah with his wife and two sons to stay in the territory of Moab for a while. Now, I want to pause right there and unpack a few things that the original readers of this would have understood, but we need to kind of unpack it a little bit to understand kind of the historical reference that's going on here. So it says this, first, that there was a famine in the land. And here's what the Bible teaches. In the book of Deuteronomy, it says this, that for the people of God, God made a covenant with them that if they would follow his laws, if they would follow his ways, that God would give them blessing, that God would give them prosperity, that God would provide for them food and all that they needed in the promised land. And and you've heard that phrase before, promised land, but I want you to think about this. It's called the promised land because God made them a promise. And he said, I will take care of you. If you follow my laws, I will bless you. But on the other side of that, he says this, if you don't follow my laws, if you go your own way, if you ignore the stipulations that I've given to you, then I will send pestilence. I will send plague. I will do my best to get your attention by sending famine so that you will turn and repent and come back to me. So when it says that there's famine in the land, we're not surprised because the Bible says it was a dark time in the history of Israel. They went through cycle after cycle of rebellion and then coming back to God, rebellion and coming back to God. And apparently this is a moment when God allows a famine to take over the land in an effort to get their attention. So there's a famine in the land. God allows it to happen to get their attention. But in that moment, it says, a man left Bethlehem in Judah with his wife and two sons to stay in the territory of Moab for a while. Now, there's there's an irony here because the word Bethlehem actually means house of bread. So the idea here is that Elimelech leaves the house of bread, the house of provision, the land of promise in order to go to a foreign land, the land of Moab, that is not the land of promise. And he makes this decision apparently because he, he says, I want to feed my family. I want them to survive. But he makes the decision, think about this, to leave the land where, that God has promised to bless to go to a land that God has not promised to bless. And not only does Elimelech make this decision, but he takes with him his wife and his two sons. And, uh, and when it comes to fatherhood, I mean, we can, kind of, we can kind of empathize a little bit with Elimelech, can't we, as dads? I mean, one of the hardest parts I think about being a dad is knowing that my decisions are going to have an impact, positive or negative, on the family that God has called me to lead. That my failures, that if I make the wrong decision, it is going to have a negative impact on my family and their future. And that's that's a tough thing to swallow, isn't it? Because here's what I know and here's what you know. The Bible says we will make those mistakes. We are imperfect. We will fail. And no one likes the thought that my failure is going to have a direct negative impact on my wife and my children. But we know that that's true. We can't get away from it. But, but here's the good news on the other side of that. I want, I want you to think about your own dad for a moment. And, and I think the older we get, the more true this is, that we see that our dads are imperfect, right? I mean, you know that there are stages. When you're a little kid, and I love this with, with my kids, it's kind of the superhero uh, kind, of, kind of stage in my kid's life where it's like, okay, get, dad can't do anything wrong. And uh, the truth be told, Adelaide's kind of a daddy's girl. Sayla's kind of a mama's girl. So in Adelaide's eyes, I can't do anything wrong. In Sayla's, I'm not sure I can do anything right. But uh, when it comes to that, it goes in stages, doesn't it? When it's kind of like, oh, dad's the superhero, and I want to do everything just like dad. And, and we know that that kind of comes in stages. Of course, as kids c- continue to get older, 
older, a lot of times in the teenage years, it goes from dad being superhero to dad knowing nothing at all. And then eventually you get past the teenage years and all of a sudden, as an adult, here's what's so interesting. You get to see your dad and your mom and your whole family for that matter. You get to see them with a little bit more of an objective perspective. That you get to see your dad or your mom, you get to see them with all their flaws. And you get to understand a little bit more what makes them tick. Why do they operate the way they do? And, but here's the amazing thing. Even as we get older and even as we get to see, wow, my dad and my mom, they're not superheroes. Even as we see that, it doesn't make us love them any less, does it? We have something innate in us. We have something that is so intrinsic to us that makes us want to love our parents. And here's what I know. Jason mentioned earlier that, that some people have horrible, awful parents and, and dads especially. Maybe dad was abusive or, or beat you and maybe it was emotional or maybe it was even beyond that. But what's amazing is that even parents who have, or even children who have awful dads still have such a longing to love their dad. Dads, we know, and, and here's where the grace comes in. Be encouraged by this. Your children will see all of your flaws. And guess what? Kids see the flaws in their parents really better than anyone else. And yet God has wired us so that we want to give grace to our parents. Even in their failure. And as we look at Elimelech, he's going to make a choice. And this choice is going to lead to some disastrous consequences. It says that they decided to travel to Moab for a while. And it says this in verse 2, the man's name was Elimelech and his wife's name was Naomi. The names of the two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. Now, just to pause right there to unpack that. Again, the promised land has Bethlehem and Judah inside of it. They travel to Moab, which is close by, but outside of the promises of God. But here's an irony when it comes to Elimelech, the name Elimelech. Elimelech actually means my God is king. And you can kind of tease this out for yourself. One of the most famous phrases that Jesus says on the cross is this, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Well, take that same Eli, put on Melech to it, and it's the, the word, the name means my God is king. Which raises the immediate question, does Elimelech live? Is he living like his God is truly king? And as we look at this, he makes a decision. He takes his wife, Naomi. He takes his son, Malon and Kilion. And they go, it says, to the fields of Moab. And they settled there. Now, again, there's a famine in the land. He's looking for food. And they go to the fields of Moab. That's describing the agricultural produce. That there were fields. That there was food. They go to this land. But notice with me, in verse 2, it says that their plan was to stay there for a while. But then by the time we get to verse 3, it says they entered the fields of Moab and they settled there. And literally it says whenever they, it says they want to go there for a little while, the word literally means they wanted to sojourn there. It's kind of like they're going on a journey to Moab. They believe it's going to be a short-term venture, but their plan was never to stay in Moab long-term. And yet that just happened to be the way that things panned out, which leads us to a principle this morning. This is something I believe we can draw from this text, and it's this. That short-term detours can easily become long-term destinations. Short-term detours in our life can easily become long-term destinations. You see, Elimelech's plan was not to move to Moab forever. His plan wasn't to settle down there. His plan wasn't to put down roots. And yet, because it was convenient, because it was easy, that's exactly what ended up happening. That he took himself, he took his family outside of the land of promise and what started as a short-term detour. We're just going to be here for a little while. We're just going to journey through. That short-term detour became a long-term destination. And church, I, I believe, I so believe that that's what happens to many believers. And, and let, me, let me give you an illustration of this. Of course, over the last several weeks, for most of the last three months, we've had to go exclusively online in terms of our services. 
uh, which created a really weird dynamic because you may have not known this. I hope I don't burst your bubble. Hopefully you saw this eventually, that we pre-recorded those services mostly on Thursday or Friday, and, uh, and then we would post them on Sunday morning so that they weren't actually shot live, which created this weird effect where I'm literally sitting there next to Alyssa watching myself preach. I know it was hard for Jason too, watching himself sing. And, uh, but here's what happened. I realized for the first time in my life why it's easy for people to miss church on Sunday morning. And I, I want to explain this for just a moment. Growing up, I didn't have a choice of whether or not I was going to church. Didn't have a choice, right? I get into high school and I mom one time and I said, mom, uh, my golf buddies, they're not saved. And guess what? They like to play. And so I, I said to my mom, mom, they really need an example of Jesus with them on Sunday morning. So I think God wants me to go out and play golf with my buddies on Sunday. And that's where God wants me to be. At which point my mom said, absolutely not. You are going to be in church and you can talk about Jesus to your golf buddies on the six other days of the week. But you are going to be in church. I did not have a choice from the time I grew up to the time I left home of being in church. And here's what happened for me that when I left home, immediately I began working for a church. Right? So now I, I have to be at the church because I'm working for the church. I go from having no choice to having no choice. I have to be there on Sunday mornings. And that had been the case all of my life until the point of Sunday mornings of COVID-19. And for the first time ever, I realized, wow, it's kind of nice on Sunday to not have to be one of the first ones there. Turn on the service at 1030. Watch it at 1130, and guess what? You can do other things on Sunday besides church. I can work at the yard this afternoon. I can go play golf. And, and I started to realize, uh, wow, I, I don't have to be all up early Sunday morning thinking about it Saturday night, tired coming home on Sunday afternoon, and then going into Sunday night. This whole day, you can do other things. And for the first time ever, I realized, oh, and if I weren't a pastor, it'd be really easy to just, well, I'm not really going to miss much. If I turn it off from 1030 to 11, I've got the whole day. And so I say this with a gracious heart. I understand the temptation, but here's the thing. It's very easy for short-term detours to become long-term destinations. I'm not going to come back to church for a while because of COVID-19 which I understand. Or maybe it's the sports season. Or maybe we're just going to go to the lake for a little bit while, a little while. Or maybe I just don't want to. And after all, it's only one week or it's only a couple of weeks. But here's what happens. Short-term detours can easily become long-term destinations. And listen, I'm not just talking about coming to church on Sunday morning. And I'm definitely not talking about wrong intentions. I want you to think about this for a minute. Elimelech never had a wrong intention in his heart. And yet the wrong intention wasn't the point. And we see this over and over in our lives, don't we? Maybe you start to chat with someone you find on the internet. And at first it seems very clean. But eventually you go down a path and a short-term detour becomes a long-term destination. Or maybe I'm not going to give my offering for a few months. It's COVID-19. We're getting out of the habit. And, but then maybe you never do get back on track. Or I never meant to start using this kind of language, but every once in a while I let it slip. But then all of a sudden I have a habit that I can't break. Or maybe it's I didn't mean to click on this picture, but now that I'm on this website, I'm looking for hours at images that corrupt my soul. You see, here's the truth, church. No one ever intends for their marriage, for their company, for their family, for their relationship with their kids to fall apart. No one ever intends that. But often what happens is a short-term detour becomes a long-term destination. And here's what's sad. Elimelech took his family there to provide for them. And it says there in the next verse, just very simply in verse 3, Nahomi's husband, Elimelech, died. 
Elimelech never intended to die in Moab. He never intended to die apart from the land of promise. And yet, a short-term detour became a long-term destination for him. And he ended up dying in the land that God was not blessing. And in doing so, he left Naomi. It says this, Naomi's husband Elimelech died and she was left with her two sons. Left alone. And this single decision that Elimelech made that made sense in the moment. There's provision. There's food in Moab. It became a legacy instead of blessing of curse. And I want us to think for a moment. Think about what Elimelech failed to see. His name meant my God is king. But look at what he failed to see. He failed to trust in the provision of God. That God would provide, that God would give food, that God would provide for Elimelech, for his family. And instead of trusting in God to provide, he looked for another source of food. He looked for another source of provision. He went to the land of Moab outside of the blessing of God. And because of that, he ended up dying in a place where his legacy would be lost. You see... Elimelech didn't trust in the provision of God. Elimelech also didn't trust in the providence of God. And the providence of God just means the control, the sovereignty, the plan of God. That instead of getting on his knees and saying, God, will you please provide? Instead of getting on his knees and repenting and saying, God, I want to trust your plan. He said, God, let me just make a little alteration. Let me just make a minor adjustment. Let's just go down to Moab for a little while. I know you say to stay here. I know that you say you'll provide. But let me just adjust the plan just a little bit. And that journey down to Moab became the destination so that he didn't trust in the provision of God. He didn't trust in the providence of God. Which ultimately leads us to see that he didn't trust in the person of God. The Bible says this, as we think about God, we're not first and foremost to think of God as a king or a ruler. The Bible says that when we approach God, and especially in prayer, we think of him as a father. That he invites us to have a relationship with him. A relationship of trust. So that instead, think about this. Instead of Elimelech seeing God as his father, as his provider, as the one who cared about Elimelech and his family more than anyone else, Elimelech chose to look away from God and not trust in God's provision, protection, and providence. Elimelech, in the end, didn't trust that his father was going to take care of him. And he may have had the best intention, but the best intention didn't provide Naomi any comfort when she had to put his body in the ground. In verse 3, it says, Naomi's husband Elimelech died and she was left with her two sons. Now, this is where the the story gets very interesting because it says in verse 4, her sons took Moabite women as their wives. One was named Orpah, and the second was named Ruth. So the sons, Malon and Kilion, they're there in Moab. And this is an indication, by the way, if you're going to take a wife from this land, there apparently was no plan to leave. Again, short-term detour becomes a long-term destination to the point where they actually marry foreign women. And in the Israelite culture, this was a no-go. You did not marry people who are outside of the tribes of Israel. And so the fact that Malon and Kilion took Orpah and Ruth as their wives, we can say with confidence, that was not something that God planned. This was not something that God intended. And yet, here's what's amazing. That this decision to marry Ruth and to marry Orpah is actually a decision that God is going to use, something that he didn't intend, he is going to use for good. And for you dads out there, listen to me. Maybe you're a dad out there and you think, I have blown it. Or maybe you're a mom. Or maybe you're just a person, a sinner out there who thinks, I have blown it. I have blown the plan of God. I have gone to a foreign land. I have not trusted in God. Here's the comfort for you today. That our God and the gospel of God shows us that God can take our worst mistakes and use those very mistakes to lead to an incredible blessing and write an incredible story. That even though it was not God's will that Elimelech leave, it was not God's will that Malon and Kilion were there and marry foreign wives, God is going to take that very mistake and turn it into something good. And we see this as Christians. We are people of redemption. We are not people of perfection. We're people of redemption. Why? Because we believe that the worst mistake in all of history, the worst injustice, the worst case of oppression, the crucifixion of the Son of God was the very deed that God used to do the most good that ever has been done, the salvation of the world, the cleansing of our sins. 
It all falls on the ability of God to take that which was evil, to take that which was wrong, and to turn that intent into something good. And God can still do that today in your life and in mine. So if you've blown it, know the story is not finished yet. God can take your worst mistake and use that mistake for something good. The sons took Moabite women, one named Orpah, the second named Ruth. And it says this, after they lived in Moab about 10 years, 10 years, both Malon and Kilion also died. And Naomi was left without her two children and without her husband. Now, I wonder if we could go back and ask Elimelech, Elimelech, there's a famine in the land. You've got a choice. You can either trust God and stay here in Bethlehem, or you can go to the land of Moab. Your belly can be full for a little while, but you will die and your two sons will die in a foreign land. Elimelech, which one would you choose? If he could have seen it like that, don't we all believe that he would have made the choice? I'll stay in Bethlehem. God, I will trust you. I'll trust your provision. I'll trust your providence. I'll trust who you are. I'll trust you. But listen, as humans, we don't get that choice, do we? God doesn't show us the consequences and then ask us to make the choice. God asks us, will you trust me? Will you trust that my plan is right? Will you trust that I will provide? Will you trust in the promises that I have given? And at that point, we make our decision and then we reap the consequences. We don't get to see the consequences first. We make the choice and then deal with the consequences as God gives them. And here's what we see with Elimelech. I am sure that if he had the chance to do it over again, he would have stayed in Bethlehem. Now, you may be thinking, Tim, I thought you said this was going to be a sermon that wasn't going to put a bunch of weight on dads, right? Doesn't it seem like it's been a failure if that's the goal? I mean, look at Elimelech and look at his failure. And you told us, yes, we're all going to fail and our families are going to reap those consequences. But here's what's amazing is that as believers, we believe that even when we've messed up, even when we've blown it completely, that God can take that very act and turn it into good. And here's the good news. Elimelech died. But if you are listening to this, you are not yet in the place where Elimelech's at. You still have a chance to turn it around. You still have a chance, listen, to... Ask God to pour out his grace into your life in such a way where the legacy that you leave, instead of a legacy of cursing as Elimelech left, is a legacy of blessing. And so I want to ask you a simple question this morning. Is the legacy that you are going to leave as a dad, is the legacy that you are going to leave as a believer, will it be a legacy of blessing? Because here's the truth. We're all going to leave a legacy. We are all going to leave a legacy behind. And the only question is, will it be a legacy that we want to leave behind? You may be here this morning and think some questions. Maybe you're here and you didn't have a good dad and you've known that. So what do you do, dads, if you didn't have a godly example in your life? This is a difficult question, isn't it? And there are many of you who didn't have a godly dad as an example. Here's what I want to say to you this morning. Remember that even though your dad did not show you the way, you have a heavenly father who loves you and sees you and even now is walking with you. It is a difficult thing to be a dad but your heavenly father has not abandoned you and will never abandon you. And here's the amazing thing. Your kids do not need a spiritual superhero. And God has never asked you as a dad to be perfect. Sometimes we place upon ourselves an expectation that is not from God, but is actually a burden that Satan would have us bear. God does not demand perfection from us. He wants humility. Humility. 
And if you are a dad who didn't have a godly example, no, perfection is not God, what God requires. Your kids don't need you to be a spiritual superhero. Listen, if you love Jesus, if you love him genuinely, you love him deeply, and you do it in front of your kids, they're going to catch on. If your faith is real, if your walk is real, it may not be the deepest faith in the world. It may not be the greatest faith in the world. But if it is real and it's true and you love Jesus, your kids will see it. So if you didn't have a godly example, know that God your Father is with you and perfection is not what he requires. Well, what do we do if our kids don't follow our leadership? Maybe you're part of a broken family and you come in and maybe there's tension there where your kids don't follow your leadership. Or maybe you've got rebellious kids. Listen to me. The greatest spiritual act as a dad is not the cracking of a whip. I mean, the Bible over and over describes God as gentle and patient. And that's the kind of leadership, that's the kind of love that over time will soften hearts. Never forget that rules without relationship will lead to rebellion. And if you have had no spiritual background, or even worse, if you've been spiritually absent as a dad, don't expect to come in as a glorious hero and for your kids to respect you immediately. No, be gentle, be respectful, lead them, and be willing to earn the right to lead them. What do I do if my kids are grown? This is where so many people are at. They have grown kids that have become wayward. And can I just tell you this? Listen, if you have grown kids... I believe that this is the stage in your life where you actually have the most influence on them. And that may seem absolutely backwards. You're saying I've got more influence on my grown kids than I do when they were in my house. I believe that's true. And here's why. Because as people reach adulthood, they begin to understand the need for family, the need for relationship, the need for that kind of input and advice. And I can tell you this, as a grown child who loves my dad and, and who and wants my dad's approval, your kids long for your input and approval. And I don't care how old you are, and let me prove this to you. For those of you whose dad is still living and you're well into your adulthood, do you not still crave the approval and love of your father? I've told you this before, but there was a lady I was talking to in her 80s. It was in the last months of her life. And you know what she wanted to talk about? She wanted to talk about her dad. And she said, Tim, I think about my dad often. And I, co I come back to a question, did my dad really love me? You see, your dad was like many men. He wasn't super affectionate. He didn't often say it. But this woman in her 80s, in the last month of her, months of her life, came back to that question. Does my dad love me? And for all of us, listen, all of us long for the approval, for the affection, for the input of our dad. And when it comes to adult children, that doesn't change. In fact, I believe it amplifies we long for love. We long for approval. And listen to me. If, if you are a dad, maybe you've blown it. Maybe you blew it with your kids. Maybe you were absent. Maybe you were married to your work. Maybe you totally left them behind. Maybe you weren't a spiritual example. If that's you, here's what I would encourage you to do today. Repent. If you've blown it, own it. Repent and talk to your kids. Call them and tell them, listen, I am sorry that I wasn't there for you. I'm sorry that I didn't lead you and love you like I was called to do, but starting today, I want to be there for you. And listen, don't make your kids fight for your approval. I mean, there are people who their entire life are motivated by some kind of complex that I've got to prove that I'm good enough, that I've got to earn the love of my mom or I've got to earn the love of my dad. But think about this. That is not how our heavenly father treats us. Our Heavenly Father loved us before we ever loved Him. Listen, if you are a dad who has adult children, you don't need to be perfect. You don't need to be that superhero. But you need to be humble. Humble enough to call. Humble enough to remind them that you love them. That you're proud of them. That you care for them. That there's nothing that they could ever do that would make you stop loving them. It would be a tragedy for your child to get to the end of their life and have any question of whether or not their dad loved them. But as long as you have breath, you have ability to sow seeds of love. The greatest example you can give to your kids, whether they're grown or not, is to be a humble man who walks in repentance.
In fact, I was thinking about this. The people that I will apologize to more in this world than anyone else are my wife and my kids. Why? Because I'm a sinner. And when I do something wrong with my kids, I don't want them to see a dad who just goes away and hardens up. I want them to see a dad who's willing to say, you know what? I am sorry. Daddy shouldn't have talked like that. Daddy shouldn't have said that. Daddy shouldn't have got angry like that. Will you please forgive me? And then let them see that their daddy isn't perfect. And that way I can point them to their dad who is. Well, maybe you're here this morning and you're asking, what do I do if I'm not a dad? There are many men who, who aren't dads and, and don't get to leave that legacy. But think about this. I, I, I reflect on this from time to time. That the two most influential voices in terms of Christianity were Jesus and Paul. And guess what? Neither Jesus nor Paul were ever married or had children. And yet they left this incredible legacy. That it's not just about our physical children, but we have the ability to leave a legacy of faith for all that God places in our path. So if you're not a dad, listen, that doesn't mean that you don't still have a legacy. And for every single one of us, moms, dads, men, women, boys, girls, we all will leave a legacy. And the question is, will we leave a legacy of blessing? So in every case, we need to be, as dads, those who let our kids know we love them, we're praying for them, we're for them. To not be afraid to tell them that, to not be afraid to break whatever cultural barriers we think exist in terms of showing love and affection, and for everything else, to to make sure they know they do not have to fight for our love. They don't have to earn it. It's freely given. And for husbands, for dads, God has given us an incredible opportunity for leadership. He never asks us to be perfect and listen. And this is where, if you're feeling the weight of it, if you're feeling the guilt of it, here's what I want you to hear. That God knows that we are inadequate for the job. That God knows that we don't have what it takes. And yet he promises us as the father of us all. That he will give us the grace and power and wisdom that we need. Not to be perfect. But to be able to leave a legacy of blessing. You see, our hope isn't in our ability. My hope is not in my ability to be a good dad. My hope is that I have a heavenly father who loves my kids, who loves my family, who loves them more than I could ever imagine. And that father promises that he will not leave me. He promises that he will not forsake me. He promises me that according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus, he will give me all that I need. He promises to supply me with patience and gentleness. And listen to me, you may be here today and your faith may be simple. But if you have a genuine faith and a genuine trust in God, he will use that to leave a legacy of blessing. But listen to me, the first step is this. If you are in the fields of Moab, if in your life right now you are ignoring God, you need to stop ignoring him and start depending on him. Come to him. And here's what he says. All you who are weary and heavy laden, come to me. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. And I will give you rest. Stop ignoring him. And listen, whether or not you've been intentionally ignoring him or not, doesn't matter. Get away from that field of Moab and come back to Bethlehem. Then the next step is simply this, to humble yourself before him and seek his face. Because being a dad is not a mantle that we can take up with a prideful spirit. It's a mantle that we have to take up every day on our knees. Asking God to give us what we need to lead our families to a legacy of blessing. And listen, the, the amazing thing is this, God will. He'll do it. And for many of you here who are here today, you know the impact of a dad who loves the Lord, not a dad who's perfect, because there are none. But the impact of a dad who loved Jesus in such a way that that love passed on to his kids. As we look at Elimelech, as we look at the story, 
I guarantee you if Elimelech could, he would do it over again. He didn't get that chance. But listen, you're still alive. You can still live like my God is king. What legacy will we leave? And as I end today, I end with a song that I hope will be true of me. And listen, for you dads who are feeling the burden, go to Jesus and let him take that burden from you so that this would be true. May all who come behind us find us faithful. May the fire of our devotion light their way. May the footprints that we lead, that we leave, lead them to believe. And the lives we live inspire them to obey. Oh, may all who come behind us find us, listen, not perfect. But may all who come behind us find us faithful. Let's pray.